painful, painful lessons. lessons. They've learned them. So you don't have to. It's so much better. So much better. This is really fun. It's so much better. Ben, will you tell me a little bit about the guest? This is a guest that you you knew about. Um, who is this guest and why would we bring her in? So I've known um, Dr. Laura Danley for gosh, probably over 10 years now. And I used to live in Los Angeles. She was in charge of the Griffith Park Observatory. So she's had a kind of pretty esteemed career at a variety of institutions, NASA, Space Telescope Organization, um, and then took over the Griffith Park, which is such an incredible, incredible civic space. And if you walk into Griffith Park Museum, there's a quotation engraved in the wall from the founder, who's a guy named Griffith J. Griffith, I believe, which is a funny name. But Griffith Grave J. Griffith went to, um, what's the really tall mountain just above Pasadena that people climb in the wintertime sometimes or go skiing on? Um, Baldy? Big Bear? Mount Baldy, yeah. So atop Mount Baldy is um, Hubble himself was actually working and Hubble brought Griffith J. Griffith up and he looked through Hubble's telescope and it was in Hubble's telescope where they first saw Andromeda and they were like, holy shit, we're not the only galaxy. There's other galaxies. So that was a pretty famous space that Hubble was working in. And Griffith J. Griffith came and looked out of that telescope and he had his mind blown and it really changed his life. And so the quotation inside the Griffith Park Observatory was, if we could look out, it's not, I don't remember exactly what it was. We could look it up, but it had something to do like if if people can see this context, it'll infect how they live here, you know. And he's like, "Hey, seeing all this stuff changed how I lived because it gave me a context for my existence." And um, and the, he started the Griffith Park Observatory to make that opportunity available to you know millions and millions and millions of Angelinos as well as people from all over the world as well as super cool movie stars who participate there in movies like Rebel Without a Cause and Transformers. Um, listen, we, are, we love name dropping. Who, which, which stars are you referencing? James Mark Dean. Walter? James Dean was there. Um, and I know Shia LaBeouf was there for that scene. I mean, Transformers 1, I don't want to get distracted, but that's a really good film. However, whatever people's view is on Michael Bay, um, they love him. they stuck that thing to the wall in that film. I love Michael Bay. I, lo I love all these big explosive movies. Love them. Love them. And I like that we can name uh, these names like James Dean and Shia LaBeouf just in the context of what we're doing. And, and I think the attitude is we sort of just imply that they're in some ways that they're with us and we're all friends. Like that's the attitude. I mean, <laughs> isn't that that's the point of name? I drop. certainly respect all the people we've mentioned so far, um, and I think Transformers should not be seen as like an explosion film. Like I think that was like a beautiful screenplay. I don't know who wrote it, but they they wrote something special there. There's a lot right. of other films in that series You're that have plenty of explosions and are totally awful. Um, I feel bad. One of my friends wrote one of those. Hopefully he's not watching this. Transformers but, is a spectacular movie. Spectacular. Yeah. All right. But anyway, so Dr. Danley, I met when she was running the Griffith Park Observatory, which she recently stepped down from running after, you know, north of a decade. And she is one of the leading astronomers in the world um, and a really thoughtful person. So I'm super excited when she comes on to talk to us about the painful lessons that she's learned, as well as share insight and perspective from her career as a leading astronomer in the world. Dude, I can't wait. I, I'm so obsessed with um, what they're finding with the James Webb telescope, this the, the new telescope that can see forever. And essentially you can see um, because of the way that um, you can see basically so far that you can see things that ultimately you're looking at them in the past because the light from them takes – now it's up to almost like 14 and a half billion years to get to us. So we're seeing things at the beginning of creation, basically, um, with this new telescope. I can't wait to hear what she has to say about it. I, 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 I am so excited by um, what, like the, the scope of the universe, the size of the universe. I'm so excited by 
everything that they're discovering. I'm so excited about the idea that we can, um, it, it's the idea of seeing into the past. It's so bizarre and wild. Um, I think it's just like an exciting time to be alive. If you're at all curious about the stars and j- and just you telling me that the, um, the Griffith observatory is even remotely related to the fact that, um, that they discovered another solar system. So that alone, I mean, the solar system is already so gigantic, so gigantic. And then the idea is that not only is there not one more solar system, system, but there are bazillions of uh, more solar systems. Then once you even get your head around, even partially how big the universe is, all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, what a treat that we are here for this, for even a fraction of a second in this nearly unlimited timetable. What a treat. I mean, get ready to have your fucking mind blown by Dr. Danley. Great. It's so exciting. Um, and also exciting because as brilliant as she is and as interesting as the field that she works in, she's also a human having to navigate life as a human, which comes with all of its challenges. And hopefully she'll get into that stuff as well. Um, I did want to book a cyborg, but well, I guess we'll settle for a human. I mean, soon it's enough. Soon enough. Um, have you tried Pi yet? The app, the artificial intelligence app that came no, from um, Mustafa Salvin? No. Um, it's really good. It feels like it's working towards her. Remember that film? Wow, really? Oh yeah, yeah, cool. I, I'll yeah. try. Around, I'll, I'll get into it right away. Yeah, like it's. You're like, oh, we're not far from being friends. I haven't dabbled enough in AI. I, th- I think my my. If it was New Year's, I would say my resolution is to get more involved in AI. That's what okay. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna do like a late Lent. Nah, you should wait. More till, you should wait till 2025. You should wait till you have a New Year's to start out. Okay, got it. Nope, no, I'm doing it now. Why procrastinate? Hey, um, I on the way over here. I'm really into. Uh, I'm so stoked we're doing this. By the way. Yeah, I'm real excited too. It's just fun to get to see you I and love talk you. about this. I feel Great. bad for our friends that they don't get to participate. Well, I I like the idea oh. that, that this is a, 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 a community. <laughs> well, we're just we're just building a community, and we know. And also, I would say we also have an amazing producer, Aaron. Yeah. Boom! And he's amazing. And who's behind Aaron? We were a team of three. That's my mother. My mother is here today. Yeah, fantastic. We were a team of three right now. Or I, there's four of us at the time, but um, I I'm listen. I'm really, I'm really pumped about something, which is that, that uh, on the way over here, so I was playing um, the a list of quotes from the Stoics for my kids. They were really into it, and one um, uh, the the guy who they were taking these quotes from, his name is Epictetus, and he was a slave. And everyone would go, Epictetus. Why don't you have the demeanor of a slave, like all bummed out and beaten down? And he would tell everybody, and and uh, he would reference something called amor fati, and he would say, "Listen, I can control um, only my head and like how I feel about things, but I can't control things. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make the most of this." And um, I think that that if you know, looking back, if someone that lived so long ago that, that could kind of not only suck up being a, a, the life of a, a slave in Rome or wherever he was, Greece, um, but but also rise up and become this amazing philosopher, like that is someone that I would like to champion. I would like to read that quotation and get to know that fellow. I, there was a um, – Victor Frankl wrote a book, I think, about his experience in the concentration camps. And similar of like, hey, what what do you choose? How do you control that which you do control in a time where so much of your life is totally outside of your control or so much of your existence is totally at the mercy of others or lack thereof? And um, it's, yeah, it's crazy how some people are able to kind of keep a positive mindset in the face of those things when it's so hard to keep a positive mindset when you have full freedom and all sorts of great things afoot. Um, so cheers to those two fellows. Cheers to those two fellows. You know, I, I, um, I have a thought of which I'm kind of excited to discuss with, um, 
the doctor and the doctor astronomer. And I think if, if I was looking through a telescope all the time, I would probably in my head, I would go, I hope I can like see God. And all of a sudden in my, just now I thought of this, if someone goes, Hey, I, I spent all this time looking for looking and looking. And I never, I don't think I ever saw God in that telescope, but man, it's like, I really love the idea of all this stuff out there. This is what I would say to them. Are you ready? I would go, you did see God and it's in the passion that you have for looking around. Hey, doctor, how are you? <laughs> Good. How are you? Fantastic. Hello. But, um, I'm so excited for this conversation. Um, Laura, before you joined, um, I told Tyler a bit about how I know you and some of the background, but maybe before we jump in, you could just introduce yourself for, so it's coming from your mouth and that's a beautiful painting behind you. Oh, thanks. It was the first painting I bought when I moved in to Los Angeles and it's uh, part of the California art club. Um, a lot of local artists just painting local things and I thought it was pretty. And so I have many, many more now. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, sure. Um, my name is Laura Danley. I'm an astronomer. I'm not sure where it's there. I guess I'll look in the camera. Um, and, uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, got a, my PhD. Well, I'll start back actually to undergraduate degree in physics from Yale. And then, um, <laughs> took two years off thinking, oh, I'm never going to go to school again. <laughs> school sucks. I'm not doing that again. And and uh, eventually realized, oh, yeah, I think I'm going to go back to school. And I went back uh, for a Ph.D. in astrophysics. Where did University. you get your where did you go to pay for your Ph.D.? A University of Wisconsin, Madison. Hell, yeah. What year? My wife went there. Cool. Go Badgers. Um, getting your physics degree at Yale. A lot of women in that track or not so much? <laughs> no, no, there were two. And uh, the other one was a competitive, she was a competitive sort. So we didn't, <laughs> it wasn't my bud. We were in competitive singing groups. We, I, I just, we never struck up a friendship. So yeah, you know, it was kind of lonely. I'll not deny that. All right, well, I'll circle back to that. But so you graduate, you get your PhD, then mm -hmm. what? Uh, then I went to Space Telescope Science Institute, which was at the time in 1987, um, preparing to launch the Hubble Space Telescope in 1990. So I thought, you know, there's no place else to go but to the <laughs> Hubble Telescope, right? That's, that's the only place I really wanted to go. Um, and sure enough, I was there through, well, the Challenger uh, incident happened right when I, uh, in my last year of grad school. So all the shuttles were grounded and, uh, you know, that was concerned because we were supposed to launch Hubble on a, on a shuttle. And then watching the shuttle come back into service, which was very nerve wracking and, you know, putting our beautiful $2 billion, which at the time was a huge amount of money, $2 billion telescope on a, you know, a spacecraft that, that had had such, ac had such a terrible accident. So, um, but it launched, it launched beautifully. And then it had the optics problems. Um, so there was three years of drama there while people figured out solutions. That's actually a fantastic story because it's a, such a testament to the creativity and ingenuity and, um, you know, just drive uh, that, that team. Oh, on the Hubble? The optics? Yeah. I knew about this. Well, Very tell cool. us, first tell yeah. us like why tell Hubble us. was important and then well, what the optics situation or issue was yeah sure um well the hubble space telescope was going to be at the time my perspective then and looking back was uh you know sort of the groundbreaking most uh powerful telescope that we had ever had um because it went above earth's atmosphere so you didn't get the blurring effects of earth's atmosphere uh, and you could have, you know, long exposures and uh, in deep of night for lengthy periods of time. Um, and so, you know, everyone knew that Hubble was going to revolutionize everything. And it did. I mean, it, it saw the first black hole. It um, extended our ability to get the distance scale of the universe, find out how far things are from there and for the age of the universe. Uh, you know, just countless areas of study were revolutionized by Hubble. So, um, you know, I knew, everyone knew, it was what everyone was looking forward to. 
um, well, not when you everyone. say you knew, when you say you knew, you mean you knew what it might be able to see? Oh yeah, we all knew that it was going to see things that no one had ever seen, and that was where all the exciting action was going to be. There was a debate uh, between money because it soaked up so much money versus ground-based telescope. But um, you know, NASA and NSF have two different budgets. That's kind of a detail, but anyway, um, in the end, everyone uh, I think came around <laughs> realizing that Hubble did things that ground-based telescopes couldn't and ground-based telescopes did things that Hubble couldn't and they were a, a good match. So um, yeah, so it was a um, just a really uh, fantastic opportunity to be able to go be in it. And I remember when I first got there, I was kind of looking around like, little old me, <laughs> we got this this national asset and I'm sitting here trying to calculate something <laughs> that better be right. And, you know, it was, it was, a, it was quite a very heady, but everyone. Well, Tyler, you go, cause I've got so many questions. I have um, a million questions. Um, did, okay. Um, you said we saw a black hole for the first time with the Hubble telescope, but did we, we had um, decided that black holes were out there before Hubble Right. We had like uh, theorized that. Yes. In other words, uh, you know, all the signs, all the pointers suggested that, that the only solution to several problems, we had discovered these incredibly bright things in the universe called quasars uh, that just put, pumped out more power than than stars could. And we knew that there had to be another power source. And uh, so the supposition was and now it's confirmed that in the centers of galaxies, there are black holes that are into which a lot of material is falling. And as it falls, the release of all that energy, um, you know, shines a lot brighter than the stars. And so, uh, so, um, but. Wait, a black hole makes a quasar? A quasar was an observational, stands for quasi-stellar object because they looked like stars, but they were in galaxies, you know, single points of light, but way far away. So no star is that bright. Um, so that was kind of the start of and um, of the big mystery, like what powers these things. And um, so, you know, theorists had theorized that, uh, you know, it wasn't going to be possible to do that just through star formation. And uh, so a black hole was a solution. But, you know, a black hole at that time, this is in the 70s and early 80s, um, you know, was a solution to Einstein's uh, equations of general relativity, but it was such a far out concept. I mean, uh, shrunk down to an infinitely small point, time stops, lengths you know, extended, uh, you've heard of spaghettification, <laughs> um, you know, in the radial direction, lengths get stretched out to infinite lengths. I mean, it's, it's beyond any ability for human, um, you know, comprehension in terms of our everyday experience. So you really have to let your mind just be very loose and accept mathematics first and whatever mathematics tells you then then you say okay i'm, I'm going to believe that and go looking for it and that's the case with black holes it was a it was an, a solution outcome of of uh of relativity and uh, general relativity and that was seemed absurd but Sure enough, we've confirmed that they're there. And that's Hubble made the first confirmation that they are, in fact, there. I'm, there's so many places I want to go, and we're going to go to lots of places in this conversation. First thing, can you idiot guide me to what a black hole is, just the physics of it, in like yeah. true child vocabulary? You know, actually, the way I started to describe it is kind of my favorite way to describe it, because... I, I think it's important for people who are grappling with some of the mind blowing aspects of astronomy and, and astrophysics to accept that everything is outside our, our, not everything, but a lot of things are outside our sphere of experience. So to accept that a black hole is a mathematical solution prediction of general relativity, that there are places in space where, uh, where the density becomes infinite, time comes to a stop, um, and, uh, you know, these, you often hear it commonly referred to as the fact that, you know, the gravity is so strong, nothing, not even light can escape. And that phrase kind of implies like the little light, light beam is struggling to get out, but the black hole's pulling it back in. But, uh, the, the better general relativistic, um, <clears throat> description of that is that 
um, that I'm going to use a couple phrases and then I'll define them that space time, the fabric of the universe, space and time uh, is so warped and so curved on itself that a light beam is just like trapped. It's just, it, it, it's following its path, which is supposed to be a straight line. Light always travels, a beam of light always travels on a straight line, but that straight line is uh, the space into which that straight line is mapped is curved back on itself. So it just, it just goes nowhere. <laughs> so they refer to it as a black hole because uh, the curvature is so strong that even at the speed of light, um, the, the curvature of space time is so strong that light they run. Great. But in a kind of contrary, um, counterintuitive way, black holes appear really bright in the sky, these quasars, because not the black hole itself inside what's referred to the event horizon, that's where, where all that warping is, but because of its strong density and its mass, it has gravity, and so material spirals into it, falls into it, but just like water going down a drain, it spirals into it, doesn't just go, whoosh, um, and, uh, and, it, and when it does that, it heats up, it crashes into all the other gas racing to get in there, and everybody's like a huge car crash and uh so just like like sound coming out of a million cars all crashing into each other at once no the light the heat and light comes from all that gas crashing into each other as they all those gas molecules trying to get into the black hole when we started before you got on the video i was telling tyler how we met and it was through griffith park observatory and i told tyler about the origin of Griffith Park Observatory and Griffith J. Griffith and the quotation on the wall, which I didn't remember, but it was sort of like, hey, if everyone could have the context, it would affect how they move. And I'm curious, <laughs> uh, that's my yeah, no, I love rendition it. I, of the, made me smile. What can I yeah. say? Yeah. Um, how has your career, passion, time in this world informed how you navigate? human stuff, like sadness, friendships, drama, like. Well, you know, this sounds like a, almost a cliche. It's such an easy answer, but it's true. You know, when to see our lives in the context of cosmic history of, you know, nearly 14 billion years, um, you know, from a, an instant of creation to uh, the formation of, I mean, the atoms in our bodies, atoms in me today, um, were there, you know, at the Big Bang, the hydrogen, the, the protons and, and neutrons uh, and electrons. So it's just been reformed in a million different ways in, in you know, the history of the universe. This, this same, you know, hydrogen atom that's in a water molecule that's from the water I just drank and now is part of my body, you know, has had a journey that has uh, led to this moment. So it's kind of hard not to see yourself in the context of a cosmic story and that that cosmic story is so enormous that, um, you know, that guy took my parking place just kind of doesn't really, you know. You don't, you don't have as much road rage as other people in Los Angeles is what you're saying. I mean, I, I, I talk to them and say, oh, hey, buddy, come on into my lane. Why not? You know, but <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, it, it doesn't get to me in that way or I guess. And even, um, you know, all the struggles that we are facing now societally, uh, I take very seriously and I take my role in it, uh, in, in that story and today's story very seriously. But there is always a piece of me that's a little bit detached that sees it as a little, the word that pops to mind is folly, but that's because that's a cliche to call it a folly. It's not, it's just human. Um, you know, we think things are important. We fight and die over them. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be this way, but it is, and that's human nature. And, and so, um, or has been anyway, but always stay optimistic. <laughs> anyway. It, it seems that okay. It seems that in within this massive um, universe, th there would be two attitudes you could have. And one, it would be I'm so tiny and and here for such a fraction of time that nothing, 
nothing matters and everything is that I'm doing is insignificant. Or you could have the other attitude, which is the idea that I exist within this magnificent story means everything matters. Like yeah. this is game time in a, in a way of like, uh, it, it would be as if everything, uh, a television show where everyone had just sat, a, a huge audience just sits waiting for the show to start for billions of years. And then finally the show's on. It's like, maybe, maybe the attitude is just everything matters. I definitely fall more into the, to the latter camp because, um, you know, I mean, the fact that there is consciousness in the universe at all and no I can attempt at present to explain it. You know, um, there are dimensions of our story that, you know, as an astronomer, you just don't explore. That's not what we're, what we're here for. So the fact that I can, as a conscious being, uh, look back, and I say back because looking out is looking back in time. Uh, as we look out to the universe, we see the farther out we look, the farther back in time we're looking, simply because it takes light time to get to us. If light were instantaneous, we would only see the universe instantaneously, but light has a finite travel time. So I'm seeing the light that left that galaxy, you know, a couple billion years ago. Um, and uh, so I'm seeing it as it was a couple billion years ago. Anyway, my point was, uh, oh, yeah, that, you know, we pieced together a pretty extraordinary story. Uh, and it's a pretty good story. Uh, it holds together very well in most and many respects uh, of the physical evolution of our universe and how, as I mentioned, the atoms got here. But this, uh, or, you know, the fact that I I have a sense of humor and laugh at things like what physics describes the fact that something stupid makes me laugh, I, you know? Um, and so I think it's for me, even though I'm a physicist, I recognized, recognize that it, it describes the part of the story that it can describe. And the, there are so much more to the story that isn't addressed by physics. And it's my, you know, pleasure to try to integrate them. Ben, I'll be my, my professor. Yeah. Yes, um, Ben, did you have a question? I mean, I've got so much to dig into with you because it's just such a pleasure every time we get to speak. My first question is, for the physicists who sort of, it's almost like a relay where physicists, obviously no one ever hands the baton. You guys are working through the whole period. But when you think of physics to chemistry and then chemistry to biology in sort of that narrative you're talking about. How do you feel about those chapter transitions? Like in some ways, and I guess I'll clarify what I'm is on my mind. Physics to chemistry feels like a math problem. And then chemistry to biology, I, I can't wrap my head around it. Magic. <laughs> it's magic. Well, you know, um, certainly we haven't solved uh, several problems. Like why does life exist? There's a good one. Um, and, uh, but I think, I, I think all the fun is in those, in those boundaries between them. I once taught a, a seminar, um, college level that where I took kids from every discipline, very, I kind of hand selected and they had to apply. And I selected, uh, I think we had, I'm getting the details. We had a bunch of students, but from every discipline. And then I had them opening day. I went into a classroom that had blackboards all the way around and had them kind of stand in front of their field and, and organize, just self-organize. How, how does this all tie together? How do, how do these work? And the conversations that came out of that, you know, the, the um, women's studies major who did a paper on, uh, you know, biological reproduction and, uh, possibilities on other planets and, and how that affects the way we look at gender on earth. You know, that's where the kind of new, new thinking and new fun is. It's not so much learning. Oh, this, this is, you know, I can balance these chemistry equations, which I was terrible at. I'll tell you right now. Um, but you know, what does that mean when you have atoms and aggregate working to develop a, a, patterns that fall into what we observe as chemistry? And then you yeah. have, 
that, you know, those molecules in aggregate working together in certain ways that, ooh, that reproduce and succeed. And so now we call that biology. You know, that that's, it's those boundaries, I think, where a lot of the really interesting questions lie. It seems like at any time, if you're like looking through this um, telescope, that the more you look and the more you kind of trip out over that there's something mysterious and exciting and that I, at least for myself, I would always just sort of just have the feeling that at any point could, I would maybe see a giant eye going to frame. It would be kind of God realizing, <laughs> Hey, you're looking at me. I'm, <laughs> found me. I'm going to go over here now, but you did find me. Um, <laughs> is there any kind of, you know, it's like, I, I just can't imagine being getting as discussing things with the depth that you are expressing and, 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 and just acknowledging that there's this bit of magic out there without um, being overwhelmed with, all right, so we're, there's definitely a God. It's all around. It's like, I, I mean, is that the attitude or is it um, kind of the opposite where you're like, we're figuring things out and we'll figure that out too, mathematically? You know, um, I have two part answer to that. The, the first is that any attachment to a cosmic experience of, of a deity or, you know, whether you call it God, because God has a lot of connotations or just whatever. And I I am fine with calling it God. I do. So that's fine with me. I'm happy. God or Santa. (laughs) Right. Um, That doesn't require a telescope and it doesn't even require the, uh, the kind of training I've had. I, I, I would say that I, those experiences are the ones I can remember, you know, as a teenager backpacking and being in a dark site you know, up in the mountains and seeing the stars and, you know, so it's not exclusive to people who look at telescopes. That, that experience of profound connection to the universe is really almost uh, more attainable through just being in an, a dark night sky, which is why it's such a tragedy that we lose so much dark sky everywhere. I mean, even now you can go out to Joshua Tree, you see the lights of Los Angeles, you see the lights of, of, um, uh, Las Vegas, you know, uh, you can see San Diego lights. It's really sad. So, you know, those places where there's a true dark sky are few and far between. And if, if um, you know, anyone listening can try to get a vacation where you drive to one of those spots and just see the sky, it will floor you and, and give you the experience that you're talking about. The other thing I wanted to say, oh, yeah, go ahead. No, keep going, Doc. Oh, very briefly is just, and this is kind of to de-romanticize it, you know, um, we don't look through telescopes, we have instruments on them, take data. So, you know, like anybody else, I go in the office in the morning with my cup of coffee, wishing I were still in bed <laughs> and, uh, you know, turn on my computer, download my data, start measuring it. Um, and uh, I particular, I was a spectroscopist, I guess I'll say was a spectroscopist. Uh, and so, you know, you just have the weekly lines. You don't, it's, it's not that kind of experience. When you come to some sort of understanding, you've made sense of your data, I think kind of your relation isn't, oh, I've seen God. It's more like, hey, I have a paper in this <laughs> I can publish. Um, you know, so it's, it's really a lot less romantic than I, you know, I wish it were kind of what you're describing, but it, it, it uh, I mean, it's great fun. You go to conferences and talk to other astronomers from all over the world, hear what they're thinking, share what you're thinking. You know, um, it's, it's, there's, it's a fantastic career and I would recommend it to anyone who has the kind of fortitude to hang in there through grad school and postdoc years. Um, but it, it's, it's not really, the work itself isn't a terribly spiritual experience as much as, you know, being out in the night sky is for me. Do you get wild at the conferences? <laughs> How wild are the conferences? Oh, it's astronomers are well known for being pretty big partiers. And like, and I think, uh, you know, I don't know, I would say second only to geologists because geologists <laughs> really go nuts. Uh, but astronomers, that's wait, that's a, that's a thing. Geologists get stoned. go nuts. That's a, people talk about that. I didn't yeah, know. Well, Cause you're out in field work and you're camping and you know, you worked all oh. day and there's that fire and everybody's got who, whatever happens to be in camp. No, that. I feel like we're going to birth a bunch of geologists from this. Yeah. Um, you said Swap something. Intense, you know, just I mean, having a ball. Sexy. Um, 
you said something to me, Doc, years ago that has stuck in my head ever since. And I'm hoping you can kind of unpack it and tell us where it comes from, which is turtles all the way down. Oh, yeah. I love that. I said that to you? Yes. We talked about turtles all the way down in like 2018. Well, uh, that and, ends... Oh, go ahead, Ben. Please finish. Well, I can I can tell you what we talked about if you want me to fill it in. Yeah, please do. Okay. So I had heard the story that someone was like contest. It was like a scientist versus a flat earth person. And the flat earth person was saying, oh, no, this. And the scientist was like, well, what is that flat earth sitting in the back of it? And they said, it's sitting on the back of a turtle. And the scientist said, well, what's that sitting on the back of? And they're like, it's sitting on another turtle and that turtle. And then the person was like, it's turtles all the way down. And I had heard it in almost a condescending way. Like, oh, this, you know, flat earth person, like turtles all the way down, knucklehead. And then you were like, nah, it is turtles all the way down. And like at in your point was that each layer peeled by science only unveils the next layer to peel. And that it's turtles all the way down. And it's like, hey, I, I remember you being like, hey, maybe someone will figure out what was before 13.7 billion years ago. And then that will just unveil the next challenge of, well, what's that? And what was before that? And so I don't know if you remember that conversation, but it's messed with me ever since in a fun way. Because I'm like, I'll never figure it out. I'll never know. I'll never understand. I'm there... hoping when I die, I understand something. Oh, I, I, well, I'm going to ignore that last sentence because that is packed yeah. and deal with what you yeah. said prior, which is, um, you know, it, it is true that everything is a construct in, in a sense. Our mathematics are, you know, everything has a, a construct uh, and um, and all of our work is based on theories. Quick side note, absolutely makes me cranky when somebody says, well, it's just a theory. Because, of course, I always feel the need to say this. A theory is a very high elevated state of an idea in the world of science. It means it's been tested and tested and tested and tested. No one's ever been able to throw a test at it that it didn't pass. And so, you know, I, I, this idea of, of fact, well, you know, it never graduates from being theory to fact. It will always be a theory because the theory is the highest level of success that an idea can have. Um, and so, uh, what makes them like gravity, for example, or electromagnetism is that we keep making, you know, you, you take the theory, you make a prediction, you devise an experiment to test that prediction and lo and behold, it passes the test and it's just over and over and over again. Um, so that's why I said earlier, you know, we do pretty well at, at describing our physical history. We've got a really pretty good, we've got some problems. Yes, when you get down to how does gravity and electromagnetism and the weak force all unite and, you know, is it strings? Is it, you know, I, I, there are things we haven't answered. And then like you were saying, Ben, the next generation will be solving those problems. And, you know, if we have this conversation 100 years from now, we'll be have a few more pieces to the story. But it's all built on constructs. The, the, the reason I loved science and love science still is because it it isn't just sort of a mental exercise you know you can say turtles all the way down but okay show me your turtles make a prediction about how those turtles move you know uh where they're going what what does down even mean where does it end you know you you can't answer those things but but uh, western science as we call it meaning the science derived from the kinds of principles of galileo and on down through newton etc um, uh, you know, relies on this kind of observation and testing of hypotheses. And, and it's got to be repeatable and it can't be just it happened. You know, anyone should be able to repeat the same experiment uh, so that everyone can demonstrate it. This is what, kind of what makes me crazy about the dialogue we're having, um, you know, in politics these days is that people will just say, here's my idea. Well, here's my idea. Well, here's, you know, well, wait, let's break that down. If that idea is the case, then what are the implications? Do we see those implications coming to fruition? You know, I, I just, uh, the, the inner, my inner Spock 
wants to, you know, apply some logic, please, to this situation. Um, and so I still think it's, you know, the most powerful way to know the physical world. I, I hope I was clear that there are other ways of knowing other aspects of life. Yeah. Um, but uh, for in terms of working out a, a cosmology or whatever, um, you know, I, I, I place a lot of faith in in the scientific method. Is there anything that you could say that would prove to me beyond a shadow of doubt that that you are real and that this isn't all just like in my head? Like, is it? I has anyone ever asked that? Like, how is there? I mean. Uh, it, everything that you're explaining sounds great and I'm sure the numbers <laughs> work out, but there also could be a chance that this is, uh, I'm just kind of, this is like an experience that I am like maybe one of God's angels and having, and uh, does anyone ever ask this? Like, could you prove that you are real? Uh, and that, that, I never that, asked me that because they're, <laughs> but it's a great question. And my answer is no, there's nothing I could say that could prove that to you. And nor do I feel like that's really um, terribly important. Um, you know, yeah, like, who cares? One way or the well, other. Um, can't prove you know, uh, <laughs> earlier when you were talking about, I was talking about, um, you know, constructs on constructs, which really are the basis of, of even, um, you know, science as we understand it. Um, I remember when I was a, I was a visiting professor at Pomona College. Great years, loved. I was two years there, <clears throat> and there was a course that I sat in on uh, by another physics professor called Situated Knowledges, and her whole thesis was kind of this: that every piece of knowledge that we have is situated in whatever the cultural or um, sometimes political or um, social construct of that time is and was. And it was a really interesting way to look at the history of physics. And you kind of come out of it with, um, you know, well, you know, what's more real than anything else? Well, does it really matter? I think for astronomers and scientists, you know, what matters is what works, what gives you an answer that you can measure. And that's called success. And I don't think, well, for me, I'll just say for me, um, you know, I, I don't look at it as a right answer so much as a successful answer that lets me move to the next question and, and paint the picture in greater detail. And in fact, I find um, I find it annoying <laughs> to listen to some, you know, people who are on camera as scientists who speak with great, you know, absolute resolve as though about, you know, whether God exists or doesn't or um, you know, any number of questions that really aren't even addressed by, by science. So, um, so I think there's a, actually a healthy aspect to remembering that we are constructing a, a picture um, that will match what the universe has to tell us about itself through, through light. What a cool concept of what's right is what works, or it's not less about what, what's right and more what actually is consistently working. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if you take that, like, to your life, like how, maybe we don't have to leave that concept, but just I'm, I want to talk about the name of this podcast, Painful Lessons, was based on this idea of like, hey, man, we all go through life with a lot of ups and downs. And I think the downs are frequently like, really shitty and painful and sometimes they stay with us and they stay painful but a lot of wise people talk about how you can take the lessons from the downs and so we were like great how do we take lessons from our downs but also how do we take lessons from other people's painful experiences thus painful lessons and um i'm curious like what has been your life sounds so dope and i'm curious if there's been any hard periods on the journey that you've outlined and if so, oh. what were they and what lessons might you have learned? I know I was going to say, because we're getting close to the end of the hour, I was like, hey, I got a whole hour done and I never had to talk about anything that was painful. Yeah. <laughs> um, no advice. <laughs> because, uh, you know, after you asked me to participate in this and you told me the name, I was like, oh, painful lessons. So, you know, I thought I spent the weekend sort of, you know, 
ruminating on, hmm, what are some of the most painful things I've experienced and did I learn a lesson from? <laughs> uh, so, you know, um, it, it's, I have the same issues that every person has, not not specific to physics. You know, I don't, I don't my life as an astronomer, the only thing I can say about it uh, that is tied to being an astronomer is that, you know, um, quite uh, um, famously, astronomy was a very, very male dominated field. And uh, so, you know, when I got to Space Telescope Science Institute, Hubble Institute, um, there was one woman on faculty. Um, and, um, and by the way, there were no women on faculty at, when I was at University of Wisconsin. So no mentorship whatsoever. Wow. Uh, and uh, the woman who was uh, on the faculty, Netta Bacall, was, you know, wonderful scientist, not interested in sort of the sociological mentoring. You know, she, she just did her science. So she wasn't much of a mentor either. So we postdocs, there were a couple of us, um, you know, uh, tried to support each other as best we could. But it was hard. And I have, you know, scars from both grad school and um, space telescope. I mean, you name it, I had it, <laughs> you know, obviously discrimination pr uh, propositions, quid pro quo, even sexual abuse. Um, uh, oh, I, um, I, I'd love to hear what do you mean? Like when you say quid pro quo, you mean that someone's like, Hey, if we can hang out later, then I'll help you with this paper. And he would just automatically help the other males with their paper, but you, he required some uh, action. And, and the flip side, which was if I didn't, uh, indeed I was left off a paper that had my data that I took as part of my PhD, it is unheard of to leave somebody off a paper whose data you're using. <laughs> um, you know, I kind of, it's everything you imagine, you know, um, can you tell an actual story? Well, Maybe we, you don't say names, but I'm just like, I, 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 I'm very curious. Could you have a, like a, an I'll, example? I'll tell one story that I, I guess, God, this is the part I hate where I know. I hope no one's listening. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, okay. So I went observing with my thesis advisor and a, and a co-author using a telescope that was uh, you know, part of the co-author author's um, his telescope. I mean, he, he worked at that telescope. Um, and as soon as my fact, my professor left and it was just the two of us, then he propositioned me a, a couple of times and it would made for a very, very uncomfortable situation because I was so naive at the time. Uh, you know, I, and, and we didn't really even know that we were supposed to like be empowered to say, you know, pardon me, but fuck you, you know, um, but you kind of couldn't do that because I can tell you, I learned exactly zero about this telescope. I was supposed to be there learning how to do, um, I guess I'll just say radio astronomy and using a radio telescope. I was an ultraviolet scientist. So I used, um, satellites in space primarily and some optical. Um, I I've never learned anything about it ever. Um, so, you know, that's the kind of thing that you can't, pin him down for not teaching me, but would it have been different? Well, absolutely would have been different if I had said yes. Uh, and it almost certainly would have been different if I had been a man and he weren't attracted to me, you know? Um, so it's a loss, not so much of, but, you know, you add up all those kinds of things, the clickiness of at conferences and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So you end up hanging out with the other women or, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so there's a lot that just Lives. happen in that. And then, um, I, I learned several years later that my, my professor knew and, uh, funnily enough, uh, this was several years later, I was already at space telescope. That incident happened when I was in grad school. And the, the person who told me, uh, you know, after, after she told me, I, I just went off to the bathroom and sobbed. I felt so betrayed that this guy that was my supposed to be my mentor just um, knew about it and didn't do anything. Um, so, you know, there's that kind of boys clubby thing. Um, and then we had a conference. I was uh, one of the co-conveners of a conference on women in astronomy. Um, 
huge thanks to Ricardo Giacconi, who was the head of um, the Space Telescope Science Institute at the time that agreed and supported the fact that there should be a conference about, you know, the struggles faced by women in astronomy. <clears throat> and one of, there was this whole session on sexual harassment. And, that's, and then it, I, it wasn't until the next morning I was sitting on my couch, you know, having some coffee before going into work. And it struck me like a ton of bricks. Oh, that's me. <laughs> I need to do these things, you know, write a letter to your, you know, all this kind of stuff, confront it. And, and it was really scary to do it to write a letter saying what he did, how it affected me and and what I wanted in return. And just the exercise of writing that letter was three pages long. Then next time he was at the Institute, because I'd see him at meetings and stuff all the time. And this was this was something that didn't happen. I mean, there are, anyway. Um, and uh, so I went into the head of HR and told him ahead of time, hey, I've got this letter. I'm going to confront this guy. If there's backlash, I want you to know. And then I did confront it and um, just, you know, it was, I'll tell you what changed. First of all, he was like, well, I, I didn't mean it. I don't know, you know, well, that doesn't matter because 10 years ago when I was a student, I, you know, anyway, and never got the quite, yeah, I did that. I'm sorry that I wanted, um, but I, I did say that, you know, I did wanted him to not do it going forward to others. Um, but the thing that changed is that at conferences, when I go up to a group, my group of people working on the same problems that I was working on. And he was there, I would be kind of like, you know, maybe I would go up, maybe I wouldn't, I'd be kind of, uh, you know, shrinking back. After that, I never felt any worry about it. I'd walk up and I'd see him shrink back. And right. that was wonderful. So I'm sorry, that was a little bit of a long story, but it, it you know, right. it, I can't say I, I didn't magically suddenly know everything about radio astronomy that I wish I might have known. Um, but there was some satisfaction in that. Is that when you mentor, I don't know if you do or not, but if you have any mentees who are women in science who are kind of rising up and obviously the, there's probably some evolution in the field, but probably not in some ways, how do you, how do you take your experience and provide guidance if you do? You know, that was one of the things thinking about this painful lessons uh, <laughs> over the weekend was, did I really learn any lesson or am I still as lost on the uh, on the issue as I was? I just took a lesson from what you just said of like, now I walk up and he walks away. Like that's yeah, a hell of a lesson. Thing. That was a good thing. But, um, and I actually forgot about it until I was mid story. It was like, oh yeah, there was some satisfaction. But um, anyway, uh, there was a very well-known first woman in the National Academy of Sciences, Vera Rubin, very well-known astronomer. And we loved Vera. In fact, the Rubin telescope is named for her. Vera was, Vera was the sort of woman who understood that the younger generation needed some mentoring and someone to care and listen. And she was, I, I just, we all loved her. Anyway, uh, she um, <laughs> was asked that question. And, and she said, well, I guess you just muddle through. Like, well, what can we do? Well, you yeah. just muddle through. And that's a pathetic answer. And it's the correct answer because that's all you can kind of do is deal yeah. with, you know, I mean, there are some, there's certainly more HR practices in place. And I wonder if, if, but then if you become that person who goes to HR and raises a case and all this kind of stuff, who's going to hire you? And how you'll never be able to demonstrate it was because you were the squeaky. We, I mean, it's such a, it's such a, um, it's one of the things I disliked about academia was that it was, you know, it was hard to measure. I mean, you could count the number of papers, but how many of them are good? How many of them were, where you just basically had one thing, you know, I mean, it's very hard to have objective measurements. So in the end, it's about who knows whom, who likes whom, who's, you know, there's a lot of, of that. Not the yeah. science itself. Peer review for proposals are all about the science. And, and nowadays, especially, they're blind. You don't even know who's proposing. Um, by the way, when they switched over to blind, the, the ratio of women getting money, money, well, money and time, because money comes with it to pay your salary or pay uh, expenses, um, you know, completely shifted when oh. it went blind wow. uh, review process for Hubble. So that's kind of interesting. Um, anyway, I, I you know, there's there's... I could, I, we could do two hours of, of injustice, yeah, it's, it's, historical injustices for women in astronomy. And, and many of them are still there, but you know, the, the way, and we knew it at the time, 
the old guys have to die out and I'm sorry, but that's what kind of what has to happen. And then, you know, be replaced with younger people and a more diverse, this is a uh, more diverse um, yeah. field. And it, and it makes me insane when they say, oh, well, but we want the best. As though the presumption is if you're a white guy, you're automatically the best because um, that, you know, here's a nice piece of evidence to the contrary. As soon as they went to <laughs> proposals, women got more, right? Yeah. So, uh, so it's, yeah. It just, it makes me insane. Um, I'm talking about how cool thank- I am because I see things in the scale of the universe. It makes me insane. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like there's still rage. Yeah. Um, it <laughs> doesn't, no, it, as it should. Um, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. I know you were like, I don't know if I want to dig into this oh, stuff, but I'm really grateful. I and really I, for, hope nobody I know ever sees. <laughs> no, I think for I'll, everyone. I'll for, for everyone who's coming up on all sides of the equation, it's a really valuable thing to hear. Um, cool. Tyler. Yeah, I'd like to end on a high note. What's the greatest party that, like, what's the best party that you had uh, in your academic life? Like, do you remember the movie Real Genius with Val Kilmer? Um, no. That was- Dude, you've never seen that? Such an amazing movie. Um, they have an amazing time and because they, they're all scientists. At one point, they turn like the whole um, dorm into like this ice uh, <laughs> thing. Where they have this loot. They they take a shot, then they go losing down these ice steps. And anyway, it's an amazing movie. Um, the I'm curious, would you tell me what's the greatest party that you remember with like other not just for academia, right? but any time in the field of science? Yeah, uh, I, there is no question, an answer immediately popped up, and no one's ever asked me that question, so I've never had to think about it before. But without question, it's the party uh surrounding the uh when Hubble optics were repaired. There, so the Hubble telescope after it was launched, it was discovered that the mirror was ground to the slightly wrong prescription. There's what a, a huge of- mistake that, I mean, I can't what imagine. Mistake. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there is an interesting. Two billion dollar mistake. Who was the yeah. lady who messed that up? Yeah, who messed it up? <laughs> lady. <A> lady. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Which bitch? Uh, bitch. That's very funny. Um, uh, yeah, and, and it could have, we never had an end to end test for Hubble, meaning light goes in one end and comes out the other end, like it's supposed to, uh, because there were no test facilities as large as was required for Hubble within NASA. There were within, uh, the department of defense. And, uh, so there was a little bit of a standoff there because, um, well, just, Bottom line, there was never a, a, an end to end test. So we did not know it until it went up. And by the way, the guy who had developed all of the um, software to evaluate the optics had his office just a couple down from mine. And uh, so he knew at, at first glimpse, first data that came back, he knew that there was a problem. It took about a month before, you know, well, let's go. And and Hubble, at this point, Hubble is how many miles away from? Uh, It's in low Earth orbit, which was achievable with a a shuttle, which is why we were able to go up and repair it. And that's an interesting thing because there were a lot of complaints about that choice to um, tie it to the shuttle, which was in part political because it helped justify the shuttle and gave the shuttle another important job to do. And, you know, the the way budgets and everything worked, that was all sort of part of the picture. Uh, And the scientific community was like, it shouldn't be so close to earth. Earth is huge, blocks out half the sky, you know, this kind of thing. But, um, but in the end, it turned out to be a good thing because we were able to to get to it. Uh Uh, Unlike uh, Webb, which we'll never be able to get to, but Webb, thank heavens, uh, is working, you know, has beautiful deployment. It was that, that was very, anyway, so there was a problem with the optics and, and it was still better than most ground based, but it was not what it was supposed to be. And so they spent about three years, uh, convening studies. I th- there were dozens of proposals about how we might go about fixing it. And in the end, uh, a, a decision was made to use this one, pull out one of the scientific instruments, put in another little thing, um, and, uh, I think it was COSTAR, corrective optics, space, whatever it was, COSTAR, COSTAR. Anyway, point is, uh, it was like a 
at the very end was like a little mechanical hand that had little mirrors on the end of the fingers, little, little like dental mirrors that, that had a corrective prescription that corrected the incorrect prescription of the, of the. So, uh, space, uh, walks, you know, shuttle missions, spacewalks, very, very tense. And the spacewalks were all night, um, uh, just because that was the time. So no one slept at the, at the, <laughs> at the space telescope for several days. Uh, and it was right at Christmas, right at the holiday time. <clears throat> so we had our holiday party. And, um, you know, I, I know I got pretty, pretty wasted. I think I, I think I might have misbehaved up. I'm sorry, colleagues at STS here. <laughs> I think I was really, really out there, but everybody was because, because, um, you know, we were getting our optics fixed. And, um, and then when the, I was in the room, when the first image came down um, and uh, it was perfect, you know, the first pinpoint star. Amazing. So people were over the top and that, 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 that was a wild time. I know we're tight on time. Do we, can I have one more question? Yeah. Laura, yeah. Tyler, sure. and Aaron. Yeah. Is that okay. Um, it feels like we're in like a, there's a time right now where it's like a rise again of nationalism where it's like, Hey, this is my country. That's your country. Like there, there's more of that mindset. It feels than I felt in a while. And I'm curious in the astronomy, cosmology, space communities, how does that, given that your work is obviously so clearly non-national, how do you guys interface? Like, do you have peers? Like, is there a different vibe amongst scientists and astronomers across borders? Um, you know, uh, there is one international aspect of it is that, you know, countries, their governments like to claim successes. So we've got the biggest telescope. No, we've got the most productive, you know. Um, and, and the United States has for a long time, you know, uh, tried to maintain that leadership and, um, and you can see that changing a little bit. Uh, but in terms of the scientists themselves, uh, at conferences, uh, you know, I'm going to say something really obnoxious, you know, scientists are really smart people and they realize that that's just really dumb. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, there's no point uh, to it, it just isn't part of the way you think about it. Like, oh, those Japanese astronomers, I'm not going to talk to them. <laughs> I mean, of course, you're going to talk to them. You want their ideas. I mean, we're all working together to push the, the boundary forward of, of our understanding. So there is there's no place for prejudice. There's no uh, there's no reason for it, you know, in the process of doing the work at conferences, publishing and reading papers, sharing ideas, collaborating with data. Oh, I need your results. You know, I mean, I had Italian collaborators, they took my data, you know, it just, that's how it, how it is because we all want the same thing. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, we might say well, those Germans, they drink a lot of beer, <laughs> but that's about as, you know, prejudiced as it gets. I, 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 at least, you know, in my sphere when I was, when I was active with it. It's just an accurate theory. Um, all right. Thank you so much, Dr. Danley. Um, I'm so Thank grateful you, that you joined Danley. us. Thank you, Dr. Danley, who is famous for as soon as the Hubble telescope was <laughs> fixed, she famously <laughs> mooned because of the whole, you know, sky and stuff. She mooned the guy whose fault it was. That would be that would be a move at that party. You'd want to shoot the moon at an astronomy party. That would be the greatest thing to do. Um, you are lovely, and thank you. Thank um, you. It was a lot of fun. Have Till a soon. Day.